Hey everyone, I'll just wait a few seconds as people kind of trickle in here. Perfect, well I'll get started here. So I'd like to thank everyone for joining us tonight for our inaugural NANS RFS webinar series. This will be the first of our webinar series um, that we have throughout the course of the year here. Our goal is to discuss uh, different topics within the realm of neuromodulation and clinical practice with a target audience towards trainees, pain fellows, and recent graduates. Um, we have a panelist of world experts here with us tonight who will be discussing the topics of spinal cord stimulation as well as the mechanism of actions and clinical indications. In regards to an outline for tonight, first we'll kind of have a panelist discussion topic um, followed by some board style questions and some polling questions. So we'll be polling the audience and we'll finish up with a Q&A session. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some webinar ground rules. So there is on your, um, you have a option here to type in some chats into the question panel and, and then at the, the questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. Um, the audience will be kept on mute during this webinar and this webinar will also be recorded and posted to our YouTube channel within 48 hours. Our panelists tonight, uh, my name is Brandon Smith, I'm your moderator. We have Dr. Ali, Dr. D'Souza, and Dr. Aruru, which I'll introduce here shortly. And uh, we had some help with our coordinators, Lily, Adriana, and Chris as well. Starting with Dr. Ali, she is a neurosurgeon who trained at Henry Ford Hospital and completed her stereotactic functional and epilepsy surgery fellowship at Vanderbilt University. She is currently assistant professor of neurosurgery at Michigan State University and director of restorative and functional neurosurgery. She has no disclosures. For Dr. D'Souza, he's an interventional pain medicine physician, assistant professor and neuromodulation director at Mayo Clinic. His research interests lie in neuromodulation, regenerative medicine, and fibromyalgia. He has authored over 80 peer-reviewed publications and serves on editorial boards for Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine Journal and Anesthesia and Analgesia Journal. For disclosure, he has an investigator-initiated grant with Nevro. For Dr. Aruru, he's an interventional pain medicine physician at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, Williamsport, Pennsylvania. He is currently adjunct assistant professor at the University of Pittsburgh with research interests in healthcare economics, value-based care, shared decision-making, and the application of quantitative research methods in government, healthcare institutions, and private industries. His research activities have been accepted into highly regarded journals such as JAMA Surgery, Anesthesia and Analgesia, Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine, the Spine Journal, Neurology, Neuroimmunology, and Neuroinflammation, Neuromodulation, and others. For disclosures, he is a consultant for Medtronic and Boston Scientific. And my name is Brandon Smith. I'll be serving as the moderator tonight. I'm a PGY2 PM&R resident here at Mayo Clinic in Rochester. I went to the med medical school at the University of Minnesota Duluth campus, and I did my transitional year at the Union Point Methodist Hospital in Des Moines, Iowa. My academic interests include pain medicine, neuromodulation, and ultrasound. So with that, I'm going to like to start off with the panel discussion. And so this first question tonight will be geared towards Dr. Aruru. I was hoping you could spend some time talking about the components of a spinal cord stimulator. Absolutely. Thank you, Brandon. Great introduction. Um, so part of what's really critical with understanding neuromodulation as a trainee and also as an implanter or as a clinician performing a procedure is knowing the components of the device itself. In general terms, they, you know, there are right around four major components from a patient perspective. Now, from the clinician perspective, there is probably a lot more that goes into the actual device itself. But from a patient perspective, you have the implantable pulse generator or what people refer to as the battery. You have the electrodes or leads, which could either be a percutaneous lead or a surgical lead where a lot of times there is some kind of surgical procedure performed on the spine to open up the area so you have a larger surface uh, lead device that can be in the epidural space. You also have the remote control which the patients can use to actually modulate the amount of energy delivered to the spinal cord that can subsequently help with pain management. And then you also have the charger. that The, the charger is usually used to further deliver energy and ensure that the battery or the implantable pulse generator is constantly 
utilized for, for delivery of energy to the electrode. So in summary, from a patient perspective, I would say there are four major uh, components to a spinal cord stimulator device. The imp implantable pulse generator or battery, the electrodes, which could be percutaneous or surgical, the remote control, and the battery charger. Thank you for that, Dr. Aru. This next question will be geared towards Dr. D'Souza. Um, Dr. D'Souza is hoping you could talk to us a little bit about the history of spinal cord stimulation. Absolutely. So, you know, the, the one might think that spinal cord stimulators are pretty recent, but it's quite fascinating. It's been around for over 50 years. Uh, the first use was described back in 1967 by Dr. Norman Shealy. He actually implanted a spinal cord stimulator in a patient with inoperable, uh, inoperable bronchogenic carcinoma. Um, really, the first two to three decades of spinal cord stimulation research was really focused on, um, on making the hardware better. There was a lot of complications like lead breakage and hardware failure and other things like that. And so, as you can see in the uh, chart displayed below, um, things on technological advancements and improvements in, in hardware technology were really emphasized. And so things like the implantable pulse generator, developing that, um, having a 16 electrode array, developing DRG technology, MRI conditionality, all those things were kind of focused in the first 20 to 30 years. The other component that was focused in the first 30 or so years was also, you know, where do we place the exact electrodes? What, you know, me placing a specific electrode in a specific spot, am I able to activate the correct pain reducing pathway? And then most recently, the last five or six years have really been devoted to really understanding the language of spinal cord stimulation. How does a spinal cord stimulator uh, communicate with the central nervous system uh, and develop uh, and uh, lead to analgesia? And so we'll go over the waveforms as, as a way of communicating with the central nervous system in a, in a later question. Um, and as you can see in this uh, chart here, additional technological improvements have been devoted also to developing microstimulators without needing um, an implantable, implantable battery, things like remote monitoring and also closed loop feedback systems. Thank you. This next discussion topic will be open to all of our panelists, uh, but we'll start with Dr. Ali. The question is, what do you think are the main mechanisms of action that provide pain relief and spinal cord stimulation? So the, 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 the common thread is we don't really know, but there are several theories uh, that have been postulated. Uh, the, the oldest theory is the gate theory that uh, uh, tells us that large A beta fibers when stimulated will inhibit small A delta fibers and C fibers in the dorsal horn and therefore reduce uh, pain transmission. However, um, that theory persists and uh, holds true when it comes to dorsal horn uh, or dorsal column stimulation. But there are uh, several other theories that are out there right now, including um, suppression or inhibition of white dynamic range neurons, which uh, cause an inhibitory effect on, on pain transmission. Uh, suppression of central excitability through supraspinal uh, excitatory uh, pathways. Inhibition of the sympathetic nervous system, which uh, helps improve uh, some sympathetic components that uh, accompany pain. Um, upregulation of inhibitory uh, neurotransmitters such as GABA and uh, beta endorphins, um, and at the same time, reduction of glutamate and aspartate, in, uh, particularly in the parsnosa, um, have been uh, reported to be some uh, known mechanism of actions. Now there's more and more data coming out that tell us that it's not just the neurons, but even glial cell activation uh, can play a part in uh, us uh, in in our understanding of uh, the mechanism of action of of spinal cord stimulation. Great, Dr. Aru, anything to add to that? Absolutely. I mean, I think the summary, and, and Dr. Roshna really went through the entire highlights. In the, in the summary is we really don't know. There's, there's so many postulated mechanisms. And what it actually does from an electrical and microscopic molecular level, you know, connecting also to neurophysiology, you know, they, there's a lot of postulation, but, but in, in, 
in a more practical um, 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 aspect, we still have a lot that we need to understand about the mechanism of action. And But having said that, Dr. Roshna really went through the hypothesis and what we know so far about how spinal cord stimulators work. Great, thank you. And Dr. D'Souza, any closing thoughts on this topic? I, I completely agree with those panelists um, that really we really don't know much about this. We've all heard about the gate control theory. We know that biochemical factors might play a role. Um, I kind of equate this to like propofol in anesthesia. We use it quite frequently. We know it works great, uh, but nobody really knows how it works. So that kind of, you know, we, and we might never know. Um, but, you know, as spinal cord stem continues to be used for not only pain, but other things like, you know, recently it's been used to reverse paralysis or not, I shouldn't say reverse paralysis, but help patients regain motor function and, you know, those with spinal cord injury. Um, I think there'll be more and more of a push to really understand the true mechanism underlying that type of, that, that type of um, action. Fantastic. So the next question we'll move on to is for Dr. Ali. Um, and the question is, what are the indications for spinal cord stimulation, both here in the United States and in other countries? Great, great question, Brandon. So um, in the United States, there are two indications that make up about over 70% um, of the indications for which spinal cord stimulators are implanted. Um, and those are failed back surgery syndrome and complex uh, regional pain syndrome. So Spinal cord stimulation works uh, for uh, neuropathic pain really, really well. Um, there's some evidence to suggest that it, it probably, you know, helps a little bit with the uh, nociceptive pain too. But most of the, the tried and tested and common indications uh, are based uh, upon um, neuropathic pain treatment. So fail back surgery syndrome, and CRPS are two of the major ones. Other indications include uh, more recently painful diabetic neuropathy that was approved by the FDA, non-surgical low back pain where uh, patients have low back pain but there's no obvious surgical pathology on their imaging um, are also some of the more common indications that this is being used for. Uh, we have some device exemptions for indications that, such as pain that's associated with uh, multiple Sclerosis because it, it is it behaves as, as neuropathic pain, uh, phantom limb pain, um, intercostal neuralgias, post thoracotomy pain, um, pain after spinal cord injury, and post herpetic neuralgia are some of the less common uh, indications where the outcomes aren't aren't as great. And then in other countries, um, uh, indications will include peripheral vascular disease, uh, ischemic limb pain, refractory angina, uh, chronic visceral pain, and freezing of gait in Parkinson's disease. This next question kind of goes off of that and it's open to the whole group here. And we'll start with Dr. Oruru. Uh, but the question is, what are some off-label indications that you've utilized spinal cord stimulators for? Yeah, that's a great question, Brandon. And in reality, the practical response is it depends on what your insurance company approves you to utilize the device for, right? Because if it's the device is not gonna be covered um, under FDA labeling, it comes down to how much clinical evidence you can show suggesting that this device will provide efficacy for your patients. Now, having said that, one of the most common reasons where, um, and, and this is not off any clinical data, but one of the most common um, reasons where spinal cord stimulators have been used on an off-label basis uh, pertains to, you know, refractory angina, um, peripheral nerves, um, things like occipital neuralgia. Very commonly, I've heard about occipital neuralgia being used as an indication, as an off-label. Um, cervicalgia, so use of spinal cord stimulator for cervical, uh, cervical radiculopathy or cervicalgia. It is, is not an FDA-approved um, indication. And in other instances, like, you know, multiple peripheral nerves, uh, it's been used in the past. But again, in reality, the practical response to this question is it really comes down to how much you can advocate for your patients to get coverage showing that these devices could be efficacious for that indication. Thank you. And Dr. D'Souza, any, anything else to add to that? 
I completely agree, number one, with Dr. Aruru, that uh, insurance really dictates what we can offer to patients. Um, I will say that I have done, um, offered spinal cord stimulation for refractory angina pectoris, off-label indication here, but uh, common, most commonly used in Europe, one of the most common indications. We have also offered spinal cord stimulation for chronic abdominal pain uh, with lead placement around T4 to T8. It's been actually reported to have efficacy in a capital study recently with um, high-frequency spinal cord stim. And then I've also offered it to chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy. Um, also, going back to the point that Dr. Aruru made, I have seen it used quite frequently for cervicalgia or even headaches, even you know, with high cervical spinal cord stim placement to treat that. And then also, I've seen it used for not necessarily pain, but sexual dysfunction. So spinal cord stim for sexual dysfunction. Again, getting these approved can be super, super hard, especially with the recent uh, insurance um, uh, restrictions. Great. Thank you for that. The next question I have here is also open for the whole group here. We'll start with Dr. D'Souza. Um, and the question is, which patient populations uh, do you feel less inclined to offer spinal cord stimulator for? Or even conversely, which what makes it an ideal candidate for spinal cord stimulation? So this is really a tough question because, you know, you don't want to necessarily deny a patient um, potential um, life-changing therapy. But there are certain risk factors that I think that might make a patient a poor candidate. So the risk factors that I'm about to talk about are not necessarily absolute contraindications, but can be considered as risk factors that might make them a poor responder. So if a patient has a high opioid, you know, OME without an expectation to wean after spinal cord stimulation, that might be a risk factor, history of substance abuse. If they, are, if they have poor compliance to uh, medical advice, um, patient, you know, and then also particular patient-specific factors that might increase surgical risk. So things like morbid obesity, if they are, have significant immunocompromise, if they have a coagulopathy that's not amenable to bridging, those are also important things. So to give you kind of an anecdote, a real quick anecdote, um, I once operated on a patient who had factor 11 deficiency, very rare. Uh, the patient was getting factor 11 concentrate while we were performing the surgery. We just made a small incision about the size of two inch and the patient was literally hemorrhaging from just that small incision. So again, risks outweigh the benefit in that point. And so that patient was not a good candidate. So we ended up aborting. So just, you know, like I said, none of these are absolute contraindications, but a lot of them should be weighed in a risk versus benefit type of ratio. Studies have highlighted other factors like younger age, mental health disorders, opioid use might also be, um, uh, you know, poor predictors of, uh, or poor uh, predictors of poor responders. Okay. Dr. Ali, anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, I mean, all very, very important points to consider uh, that Dr. D'Souza has highlighted. Um, I would say, you know, um, untreated uh, depression um, or any other psychiatric um, illnesses are um, are certainly a, a big concern. And uh, to take Dr. D'Souza's point a uh, step further, if a patient is on a high dose opioids preoperatively, I will frequently ask my, my pain partners to help uh, reduce the amount of opioids they're on. If they're able to reduce by 20 to 30 percent, it, it gives me um, hope that these patients are motivated and uh, are likely to do better with uh, with stimulation. And as as a surgeon, um, you know, we're we're always looking to make sure that there actually isn't a uh, surgically correctable pathology, uh, it, especially in a patient if they have a neurological deficit. Um, you know, those in my book would uh, would not be an ideal candidate. You'd want to address the surgical pathology first. Uh, you know treat the reversible neurological deficit. And again, I've, I have a lot of patients in my practice who went through that same algorithm yet still ended up earning themselves a spinal cord stim later down the line because uh, the surgically correctable pathology only did so much to help with their symptoms. So it, it always has to be a balance. Great, and Dr. Ruru, what are your thoughts? Oh, Dr. Ruru, I think you might be on mute right now. Great, sorry about that. No. Yeah, no, I do agree with Dr. D'Souza and, and Dr. Roshna, and because in the end, I think what it ends up happening is there are medical contraindication, but then there is also, it's a shared decision-making. It's a partnership of the patients. You know, there are certain characteristics with just the, that, that if both the patient and the clinicians 
or the healthcare providers or not if it's not a partnership it's really hard to accomplish the goal um, that 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 the spinal cord stimulators can actually have been designed to to accomplish so i do think just globally there's that huge shared decision making that comes with utilization of this really expensive therapy uh, for our patients so but but having said that i do agree with dr de souza and, and dr roshner about this thank you all for that so our next panel discussion topic um, will be first um, guided towards Dr. Aruru. Um, I was hoping you could talk to us a little bit about the difficulties with long-term habituation and loss of efficacy with spinal cord stimulation. Oh man, this is really a textbook. It's a whole book that needs to be written about this. And, and I say this because it's, it's, you know, habituation first for those who are gradually um, getting into neuro, the neuromodulation space it's the idea that there could be loss of efficacy with the utilization of spinal cord stimulator uh, devices. And, and it's really important. And the reason why this is really important is that the loss of therapeutic effect has been demonstrated in the United States and Europe through examination of explantation data. Um, now, having said that, the reason why habituation occurs remains a very complex question. And it's complex because, you know, there is a question of tolerance, there is a question of physiologic changes of the pathology and the indication why the device or the neuromodulatory component was inserted in the first place. And there is also the question about, is there a progression of the disease state? And this goes back to some of the comments that Dr. Rajna had mentioned you know, you really want to make sure there is no surgical indication prior to inserting these neuromodulation therapy devices, because if that's the case, you could require a fusion in a couple of months after a spinal cord stimulator has been placed. Now, having said that, really it comes down to the idea that habituation is a very complex process. You know, a lot of conversation and dialogue has been around physiologic adaptation and how the human body and the disease could actually change its physiologic status, thereby resulting to the actual neuromodulatory therapy not working as efficacious as it used to compared to the trial phase. Um, and, and, and it's more of the idea that there is a new set point now the reasons why all of these happen it remains very complex um, as the body changes we're hoping that the neuromodulatory programs or waveforms can also adapt and hopefully can stay in sync to minimize some of the effects we see from long-term habituation um, one of the things that i always think about is hypertension and cerebral autonomic regulation you know as pa patients who are hypertensive tend to function at a higher physiologic uh, pressure compared to patients who are not hypertensive. Well, over time, if you think about it, neuromodulation is not any different in the sense that patients who have a degree of chronification and have progression of the disease, there is a new set point of therapy that needs to be attained. So the, the short answer to, to your question, Brandon, is it's very complex and it's very dependent on the physiologic or pathologic changes that occurs with patients and the disease process. Thank you for that. Uh, Dr. D'Souza, any other insights on that? Yeah, I agree with Dr. Aruru. So habituation is really a common theme that occurs in many things that we do in life in general and medicine. So whether it's building up a tolerance to opioids or um, you know, the hypertension example that Dr. Aruru brings up, you know, like tap, even building up like tachyphylaxis to a vasopressor you know, that, that ICU patients might, you know, hypotensive ICU patients might have um, everything in life, I think, and in medicine, uh, patients develop a tolerance to. So similarly, with spinal cord stimulation, it's common to experience habituation from long-term therapy, but it's hard to determine, distinguish that versus, you know, patient degrees, disease progression. There are strategies that have been implemented, such as, you know, reprogramming the waveform, a completely new waveform, or even trialing additional neuromodulation devices, like, you know, besides dorsal column, you know, trialing a DRG or peripheral nerve stem, optimizing their medication regimen. Sometimes even to the best of our, avail or best of, best of our ability, things might not work. Um, and so sometimes implementing something called a holiday, a stimulation holiday, kind of analogous to a drug holiday even, 
Um, sometimes it could even lead to resetting of those pain receptors and pathway. And, you know, such that when stimulation is reinitiated, you know, patients can get salvage and rescue of their analgesia. Again, all these are, you know, very complex and, and more research is needed. Dr. Ali, any final thoughts on this question? Uh, agree, agree with my fellow panelists. The, you know, uh, the placebo effect, the Hawthorne effect, um, all should be in the back of our minds when we're uh, when we're considering this. Um, you know, it affects about 15% of of the population that gets uh, spinal cord stimulators implanted. So it's it's a real issue. Sometimes it's just as simple as epidural scarring that forms uh, at the at the region of the the stimulator, and sometimes uh, just going in and surgically uh, replacing the stimulator can sometimes be helpful as well. But, um, you know, changing the different waveforms is, is a very good rescue therapy. That's super interesting. And thanks for your input on that. Um, the last panel discussion we'll talk about will be open to the panel as well, but we'll start with Dr. D'Souza. I was hoping you could talk to us about the different types of spinal cord stimulation waveforms, as well as kind of some thoughts on um, which type of waveform you're using for which type of patient. So there are many different types of waveforms. So tonic or traditional stimulation, there's HF10 or 10 kilohertz stimulation, there's burst DR, there's differential target multiplex or DTM, uh, and then there's most recently closed loop stimulation. Um, I don't like to say that I prefer one device or one waveform or, you know, it's kind of hard to say. There's many different factors that play a role in my decision. I think the most, uh, admittedly, the most uh, single most important factor really for me is how good and dependent your rep is, um, because really the, the delivery of care to your patient really ultimately depends on how good your rep is. Um, but other factors also play a role for me. So, you know, the, there has to be an FDA approved indication for a specific waveform. So, for example, if I'm offering a device um, like high frequency spinal cord stimulation or tonic stimulation for PDM, that is FDA approved. So having evidence for that. Um, sometimes there are very special cases, like you know, if I want to avoid IPG site pain in a patient, I don't want to offer them a pocket site. You know, considering offering a system that does not have an implantable battery. Another special situation is somebody who lives a long distance away, offering a device with remote monitoring and reprogramming that can be advantageous to them. And then obviously other factors that I consider are things like device MRI compatibility and recharge burden. But again, you know, all these are factors that play a role in my decision. I don't think, you know, one special device is, you know, that I always choose to implant. I don't believe in one size fits all in our field. I choose a device that really best, best fits the patient's needs. Uh, Dr. Ali, what are, your, what are your thoughts on the types of SES waveforms? Uh, completely the same. Um, um, you know, uh, thought process, as Dr. D'Souza mentioned, has to be a patient tailored uh, uh, device selection and waveform selection. Um, and in an ideal world, what I imagine the future of spinal cord stimulation to be is that we, so in spinal cord stimulation, uh, I know we didn't talk about this much, but before we implant a permanent system in anyone, we do a trial uh, where the patient gets leads implanted, it's uh, hooked up to an external pulse generator. The patient gets to try it out for a certain period of time. Most of us do, you know, a week to 10 days worth of trialing. And if the patient reports 50% or more improvement, then they, they earn themselves a permanent implant. And in an ideal world, I would like to be able to trial a patient with all the different types of waveforms that are available. Unfortunately, right now we're limited because certain devices come with uh, proprietary waveforms. But in an ideal world, to truly make this a patient-centric uh, decision based on the, the, the technology, uh, we, in, in, in the future, we should be able to try uh, all the different waveforms for each patient and determine uh, which patient is going to respond better. And furthermore, you know, uh, touching a little bit about the last question on habituation, when patients do uh, experience habituation with one particular waveform, the, the ease of switching waveforms is, uh, is limited because uh, a lot of times you have to change out the device completely. And once again, in an ideal world, if the same device could deliver uh, different waveforms, uh, we could battle uh, the issue of habituation much better. 
And doc, Dr. Aru, any final thoughts on this question? No, this is, I, Dr. D'Souza and Dr. Ali has really bit this down. And I think when I, when I think about deciding on which therapy to choose for my patient, it really comes down to the concept of shared decision making. And everyone on the team has to be, you know, on the same page and the, the buying has to be really strong. And it echo, I, I really want to echo what Dr. D'Souza had mentioned. Your representative is really an extension of your clinic and they can significantly impact, um, you know, the outcome of, of this therapy. Because what happens is after the patients receive the device, there is constant communication and engagement to ensure that as the patient's activity level goes up, as they choose to do more because their pain relief is better, you know, there has to be that constant communication to ensure that they're getting the programs that they need to stay active with pain relief. So I, I do echo all of what my colleagues have mentioned, but it really comes down to working with a team, including the patient, your representative, and even your office staff to ensure that the patients are currently getting the treatment that they need after the implantation. All right, well, that was super helpful. I really appreciate you guys' uh, the panel discussion here. We're gonna kind of transition this webinar into our polling system now for some board style questions. So I'm gonna read the question. You guys will have uh, some time here to answer each question here. You can use your polling system on your own um, interface there. So the first question is, which of the following is a true statement regarding pain fibers? C fibers are responsible for sensing vibration and joint proprioception. A beta fibers have the slowest conduction velocity of pain fibers. C fibers have the fastest conduction velocity of the pain fibers. Or lastly, A delta fibers are responsible for sharp pain and light touch sensation. I'll give you guys about 30 seconds to get the answers in. Great, and then we'll have Dr. D'Souza kind of go through these answers with us here. Then we have a little Perfect. slide associated with this. So, yep, the, the correct answer is D, that um, A delta fibers are responsible for sharp pain and light touch sensation. Um, as you can see in the slide that we provide here, we kind of break down individual characteristics for each nerve. So C fibers, they're really known for transmitting, you know, kind of the slow pain, the second pain response. They're pretty slow because they're non-myelinated. And so thus, you know, signals tra travel pretty slowly with that, um, with that nerve fiber. A beta fiber is what's really present in your dorsal column. It conveys touch sensation. It conveys nociceptive stimuli. It has one of the fastest um, conduction velocities. And then the last one is A delta fibers here, uh, which are responsible for sharp pain and light touch sensation. These nerves are myelinated and they transmit pain signals much faster than unmyelinated C fibers. So that first pain response that you get is usually due to the A delta fibers. Great. We'll go on to our second polling question here. So the second question is, which of the following is not an FDA approved indication for spinal cord stimulation? Is it failed back surgery syndrome, refractory angina, painful diabetic neuropathy, or non-surgical low back pain? And we'll have Dr. Ali talk about this question when we're done. All right, Dr. Yarali, I'll have you talk about this question. 
Fantastic. So it looks like most of you got it right. Uh, you're paying attention. Uh, so absolutely correct. Fail back surgery syndrome, painful diabetic neuropathy, and uh, non-surgical low back pain where there's no surgically correctable pathology and imaging are all um, uh, well-known FDA-approved uh, indications for, 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 the, uh, for the implantation of spinal cord stimulator system. Uh, refractory angina is uh, not FDA-approved, but is still widely used outside of the U.S. and uh, in certain situations, even within the U.S., when um, you know our, our insurance partners are uh, able to uh, provide us the the clearances needed. The the mechanism of action with the through which SCS is effective for refractory angina uh, takes us back to its uh, effect, its inhibitory effect on the sympathetic nervous system, and it can lead to uh, to vasodilation uh, and improve uh, the pain that's associated with refractory angina. Great. Yeah, that makes a lot more sense now. We'll go on to our third polling question. So the third question is, what is the most common complication after placement of a spinal cord stimulator? Is it infection, lead migration, CSF leak, or device malfunction? And we'll have Dr. Aru discuss this question when we're done. Okay. How'd they do, Dr. Aru? Great. Sounds like everyone crushed this question. That's awesome. Uh, now, overall, the complication rate for spinal cord stimulator uh, therapy uh, in ranges from 28 to 48 percent, depending on which literature you, um, you're, you're reading. However, lead migration by itself was studied by Cameron et al., where 22 percent um, of patients who had spinal cord stimulators were actually found to have lead migration. Now, when you look at infection, it gets to be a little bit complex because one has to really think about superficial versus very serious infection. Uh, the superficial infection rate is right around 2.5 to 7%, again, depending on which study you quote and you're reading. Um, but for serious infection, the rate is extremely low, and the commonly quoted number is less than 0.1%. Um, regarding CSF leak, as well as um, um, device malfunction, uh, the rates are way lower compared to, to lead migration. Might be helpful to take myself out mute here. All right, well, that sounds great. Yeah, we'll go on to the next polling question here, question number four. So the question number four reads, in the United States, what is the most used or most common indication for spinal cord stimulation? Is it CRPS, radiculopathy, failed back surgery syndrome, or diabetic peripheral neuropathy? And we'll have Dr. Um, Dr. D'Souza help us with this question. Well, Dr. D'Souza, how'd they do here? They crushed it again. So the correct answer is uh, failed back surgery syndrome. It's more commonly known now as persistent spinal pain syndrome type two. Um, so you'll be seeing that term most, more used more frequently. Um, and then in Europe, uh, that it remains uh, refractory angina pectoris is the most common indication there for spinal cord stimulation use. Perfect. Let's go on to question number five here. Which of the following accurately describes the concept of gait control theory for spinal cord stimulation? Stimulation of A beta fibers, modulate painful signals conducted by A delta and C fibers. Stimulation of inhibitory neurons will lead to an increase in painful signals perceived. Electrical stimulation causes glial depolarization and glutamate release. 
Stimulation of A delta fibers modulate painful signals conducted by A beta and C fibers. Give some time for people to read through those answer choices and Dr. Ali will help us with this one. All right, Dr. Ali, take it away. Strong work, gang. Um, nailed it. Uh, so the correct answer is, as uh, you know, we discussed a little bit earlier, uh, the gay theory is based on the larger um, A beta fibers uh, modulating painful signals, and basically they overwhelm the the painful signals that are transmitted by the smaller. Um, a delta fibers and the unmyelinated C fibers because their conduction velocities are much slower. Perfect. And we'll move on now to our last polling question. Question number six. It's a little tougher one here. We'll see how they do. Um, which of the following waveforms is responsible for stimulation of the medial pain pathways of the spinal cord? Is it high frequency stimulation, tonic conventional stimulation? Burst stimulation with passive recharge or burst stimulation with active recharge? And Dr. Oru, you'll be helping with this one as well. All right, Dr. Ruhr, I'll let you take this one away. Oh, wow, this is this is great. It's 31%. I think if I had taken this question without the answers being revealed to me, I would probably be around the 17% category, partly because it's a really, really super specialized question. Um, and and when you think about path, when you think about um, uh, the medial pain pathway, the, the correct answer is C, which is burst stimulation with passive recharge. It's really important to understand the passive, the concept of passive recharge um, when it pertains to bust, uh, burst stimulation, partly because it involves the use of five one millisecond electrical impulses um, at an intra burst frequency, burst frequency of 500 hertz. Now, the reason why that's, why that's critical is Burst uses a principle that you have five electrical impulses that are delivered in this inter-burst frequency of 40 hertz, um, um, although it's similar you know, in amplitudes to traditional SCS, it, is, it really creates this passive recharge process um, that can actually at least hypothesize to stimulate the medial uh, pain pathways of the spinal cord. Now, when you think about high frequency stimulation, tonic conventional stimulation, burst stimulation with active recharge, um, at least to my knowledge, it hasn't been um, strongly correlated and shown to provide um, um, stimulation of the medial pathways. Thank you, panelists. That'll conclude our um, polling features here. Um, our last section that I want to go over is our Q&A section. We have a lot of good questions here in the chat. And so I'll open up this question to all of the panelists, but someone is wondering if you guys follow like specific algorithms in regards to when you would initiate neuromodulation. For example, do, do you hope or expect someone to have a certain amount of physical therapy beforehand or tra failed so many other kind of medications or other interventions before you even consider neuromodulation? Yeah, I think the overwhelming answer here will be yes. Uh, it does depend on the indication 
for uh, neuromodulation because one thing we do know is um, sure you don't want to do it you know the, the the first week after injury but you certainly don't want to wait too long either um, you know if you look at literature for different disease states for example for CRPS um, you know they you want to have them uh, go through some aggressive physical therapy uh, for for the initial three sometimes even six months but then not delay uh, implantation. However, if there is significant delay in implanting at about the five-year mark, um, you see that the benefit patients get from, from spinal cord stimulation, if implanted significantly later in the disease process, um, it, the outcomes are, are about the same as if the patients were, uh, you know, just doing aggressive physical therapy. So there's, there's, there's this appropriate window of opportunity. Um, so you certainly want patients to try uh, non-invasive therapy in the form of physical therapy, any type of other, you know, pain interventions, especially if you're dealing with the persistent spinal pain after surgery. Um, but typically, uh, you know, after six months of, of physical therapy and other conservative measures, if uh, the patients are not improving, then in my practice, at least, I would proceed with, uh, with neuromodulation, but that can vary depending on what the indication is. Dr. Aru, Dr. D'Souza, anything to add to that? Sure, I, um, so I completely agree with Dr. Ali. Um, you know, going back to, so recently the CMS guidelines for Medicare reimbursement also came out and, and mentioned in there that spinal cord stim should be offered as a late resort or as a last resort. So I still tend to abide by that. Um, and again, going back to the point that we made earlier, it's that, you know, this is all patient-centric care. So I give patients the menu of options stating that here's the most conservative option, the least invasive option being physical therapy, ranging all the way to one of the more invasive options, which is spinal cord stimulation. And I share with them the efficacies that have been described in the literature, uh, the mean efficacy for each type of intervention. But again, as Dr. Ali alluded to earlier, is that you know different patients are different and different indications are different. And so kind of um, making sure it's specific to that, that patient, that's very important. So when you offer the spinal cord stimulator in your algorithm it might be earlier than you think, or it might be later. It's all kind of dependent on the patient and their indication. Yeah, I, I, I do agree with uh, uh, both of my colleagues here, partly because, again, it comes down to that shared decision-making process. I've had patients show up, they've had their spine fused, they've had multiple injections um, where, you know, they've really exhausted a lot of option. And at that point, I do consider performing the spinal cord stimulator therapy instead of repeating it all over again. Um, but then on the other hand, there are patients that are just super early in the process and and, and they may not even require the use of, of spinal cord stimulators. And, and that's where it's so critical to ensure that they have, their, you know, there's emphasis on multidisciplinary approach to ensure that they get pain therapy before, you know, pain therapy that are more conservative before jumping into more advanced uh, neuromodulatory approach. Perfect. I got another good question here. Someone asked um, if we could elaborate a little bit or talk a little bit about closed loop systems. That's something we didn't get to through this lecture. Um, and our thoughts that they would decrease habituation. First, like what is closed loop systems and um, your thoughts that that would decrease habituation? I could talk a little bit about closed loop stimulations. Oh, go ahead, by Dr. Oru, go ahead. Well, no, it's, I think this would be one of the things we can all talk about, Ryan. Please go for it, please. So, yeah, I, I was, I was, I was going to say that, you know, as closed loop implies to closed loop. So it depends on the response you're getting from a particular stimulus. So, you know, the, the, the spinal cord stimulator lead will send a specific signal and depending and then what it'll measure is something called an ECAP or evoke compound action potential. And that's what it's monitoring from the dorsal column. And, and the primary goal is that based on the ECAP signal that, this, that, the, that the stimulator is reading, uh, it's gonna adjust the stimulus back. So let's, and it all varies based on distance. So let's say if you know, I give a particular stimulus from a spinal cord stimulator, and uh, let's say that my spinal cord stimulator lead is pretty darn close, so I'm potentially overstimulating. Well, that ECAP signal may be pretty high. And so then my spinal cord stimulator will readjust to deliver a smaller amplitude 
um, smaller amplitude impulse. And so it's always constantly adjusting and adapting based on what the ECAP read is. That's my interpretation of it. Yeah, absolutely, Dr. D'Souza. And the, other, the way I think about it is the idea that you have the ability to deliver energy, but instead of a constant amount of energy, you have the ability to better communicate between the device and the spinal cord, and you adjust the dose of the stimulation to help maintain that pain control. And as it pertains to habituation, it's extremely critical, at least you know, from just our basic knowledge of, of, of habituation. And it's the idea that now not only do you have the ability to deliver energy, but you can change it, you can alter it. You can alter it based on how the patient's activity level or position could change. I'm not sure we can draw strong, uh, such strong correlation with disease progression, but habituation in a context of uh, disease progression may be a little bit tougher to tie that in, but at least knowing that you can vary the amount of energy and the amount of therapy you're giving to the patient without switching the device, I, I think it's more of the concept that could be associated with closed loop communication and potentially, hopefully, seeing some association with um, um, uh, less severe habituation process. I completely agree. You know, I think the the, the use of closed loop systems um, across the field of neuromodulation, not just with spinal cord stimulation, is gaining a lot of uh, excitement. It's it's being routinely used in, in other neuromodulatory uh, fields. Um, it's, a, it's a smarter way of delivering energy. Um, it allows uh, for longer battery lives. It um, allows us to potentially mitigate uh, habituation and perhaps even, um, you know, overall loss of efficacy over time. Great. I think we got time for one more question here. Um, there's a question in the chat and they're asking um, if we found any conditions that are typically not indicated for spinal cord stimulator, but we've noticed that these have gotten better after the example they provide is you put a spinal cord stimulation in for failed back surgery syndrome, but they also have fibromyalgia, which got improved. Have you noticed any other indications that have gotten better after a spinal cord stimulator implant like that? I'll tell you from my personal experience, and these are usually the patients that I've seen just tremendous results. Right? I mean, we're talking about patients who have, they've had, they don't require surgery. They don't necessarily have very, very obvious mechanical reason why the nerve roots are compressed, you know, and I specifically have seen a few patients with autoimmune condition. You know, they come in with some kind of autoimmune process. I don't understand why, because you would think autoimmune is more inflammatory. And here you are providing neuroceuticals, not pharmaceuticals, and you're getting such tremendous response. Um, you know, I, it's, it's very bizarre. It's very strange. But I've had a few patients with these autoimmune conditions um, where it's not really clearly arthritic or facetogenic or discogenic or even neuropathic but the response is, is just incredible. Um, and I'm not sure if there, are, you know, there are providers out there who are seeing similar observation, but it's something I've noticed um, um, among my patient cohorts here at Williamsport, Pennsylvania. Good, any other insight, Dr. Ali or Dr. D'Souza? Yeah, um, an interesting um, sort of serendipitous um, uh, encounter was, uh, so I'm a, I'm a functional neurosurgeon, uh, so I do uh, DBS for Parkinson's disease um, as well, so I have some Parkinson's disease patients in my in my clinical cohort, and um, I um, I implanted a spinal cord stimulator in a patient uh, who already had a DBS system for Parkinson's disease, but the indication to put the spinal cord stim was uh, refractory, low low back pain and radicular pain, and uh, this patient and I alluded uh, to it in my in my earlier answers about indications for SCS as well was, um, you know DBS typically does 
doesn't help a ton with freezing of gait uh, in Parkinson's disease patients. And serendipitously, you know, when, when we did uh, implant the spinal cord stimulator in this gentleman, not only did his, you know, low back pain, radicular pain improve, but his freezing of gait got, got better. And kind of looking back at the literature, there's a lot of uh, a lot of the work that the Europeans have done have been uh, implanting these spinal cord stimulators in various areas of the thoracic spine. But typically, the 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 mid thoracic spine is where they've seen the most efficacy, and that is traditionally, you know, kind of around the T8 mark is where most of us will put our implants. You know, obviously results may vary depending on the trial, might be a little higher, a little bit lower in certain patients. Uh, so that was, I, you know, th that was just wonderful seeing, uh, you know, sort of a, sort of a double serendipitous hit in that individual. I, uh, love the points brought up by my colleagues, Dr. Ali and Dr. Aruru. Um, I have, you know, I think pain is very interconnected. There is, then it's very complex. So a patient that I might've placed a spinal cord stem for, for, you know, persistent spinal pain syndrome. Um, they, it's not uncommon for them to have other sources and other generators of pain. And as we all know, spinal cord stimulators can treat a variety of different pain disorders. Um, as you brought up in your question there, Dr. Smith, um, you know, fibromyalgia patients, I'm a huge advocate for fibromyalgia and I did a lot of my research is focused on fibromyalgia. So I have offered patients uh, who have a history of fibromyalgia, um, but you know, I've offered spinal cord stimulators to them for um, an FDA communication like persistent spinal pain syndrome or um, CRPS, and I have not only seen their initial indication improve, but also just their general fibromyalgia, because like, as I mentioned, pain is pretty complex. It's all interconnected. And so uh, I have seen it help both, both uh, disease states. Thank you for that. Yeah, that's going to conclude our Q&A session. Before we end the webinar today, I was going to talk a little bit about some upcoming um, NANS-related events. Um, as we are here today uh, we will have these webinars here quarterly so we'll watch out for your emails and social media regarding these webinars for our nans mentorship program this is a program for incoming and outgoing acgme pain fellows as well as current acgme neurosurgery residents it's a six to eight month relationship that includes multiple communications um, covering topics not addressed during fellowship it also includes a physical site visit and a culmination meeting at the nans annual conference the deadline for this admission is on July 15th. For any questions, there's an associated email here for you. The Education um, Committee um, is rolling out their new educational content in the form of video abstracts of published literature. The content um, will mostly follow along with these webinars um, and provide additional learning material. If anyone is interested in helping out make or helping make some educational content, we will post a link to it in the chat here and there'll be more information for that to come in our some social media. And lastly, and like I said, that link for the education should be dropped in the chat as well. Let's see, it's kind of stuck here. There we go. Oh, <laughs> it was just a slide advertising for our NANS annual meeting um, and coming up January 12th through 15th in Las Vegas. The um, abstracts for this are open and you can submit you have to submit by july 28th so we hope to see you all there thank you everyone again for joining and this will conclude our webinar thanks, thanks for having us thank you thank you take care